Hi, my name is Karen Clark. I am from Richmond, Virginia. I am a sculptor coming to Maryland to do a private showing for some of my clients. Um, the work that I do is actually um, inspired from my trips to Africa from 2006. Um, I went to Senegal and I was um, with, uh, it was called the Artist and Art Lovers and um, wanted to get some inspiration to find out what would make an impact with the African culture and how I could bring it in to America or to the United States and so that African Americans could see the work. The reason why um, I did that is because a lot of the time dealing with sculpture, we don't, un unfortunately, we don't, we're unable to see ourselves. So we see the Greece, um, Grecians who are creating things. Uh, we see a lot of contemporary pieces that are being done, but they're not done in the African American or the contemporary version. Um, so I wanted to give a splice of the African world, but also give a splice of the contemporary world. Uh, with that being said, um, a lot of the things that you're, the, the bodies of the work that I'm doing is called the inner voice. Inner voice, inner spirit, royal travelers, those are some of the series. And this is to tell the story about what is within you. Because a lot of times we look at some of our faces and we're probably some of our worst critics. Um, and we have to re realize that it's a two parents who have actually created something so beautiful. You're a miracle. And I wanted to let people know that um, when we are looking at one another, it's not, what you're, it's not the visual that you're looking at. You're looking at the inner voice um, or the spirit of that person. And that's what you're truly connecting with. Not um, their eyebrows or their eyes or their body. You know, you're connecting with the minute that they speak and that's what you connect with. The reason I became an artist, it wasn't um, where I said to myself, oh, I think I'm going to become an artist. My parents actually cultivated uh, me being an artist. So I have a long tradition of family members. So I have a mother that is a seamstress, a sister who's a photographer, a brother who's an artist, a father who's a sculptor, and um, he is the one of the amazing chefs that I know. Um, so I kind of followed behind his footsteps. But what happened was they put us in all of these projects. So I was in ballet, candle wicking, uh, needlepoint, ballet classes, classical music studies. And so all of that played a part in cultivating what's happening now. So what happens is I'm watching television. Uh, I am very close to my mother. I'm watching PBS, uh, which is the public broadcasting system that we all know, WETA, I guess and um, see a uh, potter, her name is Nya Went Weaver. And I called my mom and I'm like, Mom, uh, did you see? She's like, yeah, I saw you, you wanna take that class? And I'm like, yeah, do you wanna take it with me? Well, my mother became a two year dropout. I continued with the class. And um, then uh, I became, I did internship with Nya. From there, it was mentorship. And then from that point, we became business partners, and we're still together from this point on. So it's now been 22 years that we've been working together. So um, it's fun because we get to throw off ideas. So she's from Vietnam, I'm from America, but I still have my African descent. And we kind of mesh together because a lot of the things that we see in America are really coming from a lot of the other countries. We don't realize how persuaded we are by the Asian, the European, the African cultures. And um, it's really fun to be able to blend um, the shapes or the um, vessels that are coming from Asia and actually implement, implementing the, uh, the, the designs um, of the African culture on those same vessels. I, what I would say to a lot of the artists who are um, up and coming uh, and in this very moment that you have to appreciate your craft but you also need to um, respect everything that is about that craft so it's not just focusing on the art you have, also have to understand that you need to learn how to market you need to um, learn how to um, 
you well, what I'm basically saying is you have to treat it like a business. So it's not just about the art because a lot of people think that art speaks for itself. Art does not have a voice. You actually give it the voice. So that means that you need to market, you need to advertise, you need to understand that tomorrow's not promised. So you need to focus on that work. I understand people want to play and have a great time, but dealing with your work when it speaks to you, you do need to um, continue to create. Everything else can be placed to the side. Okay, but what I am saying is that a lot of um, artists, they um, they want to be an artist, but I think that they need to understand that when you are in college and you are taking those art courses, that you need to take those business and marketing courses because it is very, very important. So, um, um, and you have to work. You have to work because um, it's not given to you. Um, the... The thing for me is that while that's going on, I still do a lot of things. So I still create, but not only am I creating every single day, so that's Monday through Sunday if I'm not doing a show, but I also teach, I also work a part-time job, and so that I can keep supplementing what is going on to make sure that this happens. And so it actually, when I'm doing this, it prepares me for my trips over to Africa. So I go to Senegal where I have a farm where I'm raising moringa and cashews and mangoes. And this is helping another group of people. But while I'm over in Ghana, I'm sending money over in a different direction to 12 girls to make sure that they are sustained and so that they can have the education that they need. And those are some of the things that are important. So not only are you an artist that you're absorbing everything, but you also have to make sure that you are giving back to wherever it is that you're going. And so um, I go over there once a year. Um, to Ghana and Senegal. So over in Ghana, I go into Kumasi and I work in the cultural center and I give them um, ideas of what is going to help them uh, um, make themselves better, a sellable product. So when Europeans are coming in, they cannot buy things that are six feet tall and eight feet wide because it would be, they can't take it home, but I'm teaching them how to make small items that will be able to go in their backpack. Dealing with the pieces, um, it varies. Um, I usually, when I'm having inspiration, I don't just do one, I do them in groups. So for instance, uh, this is part of the Royal Traveler series, and uh, it's a lot of, um, it takes about 36 hours to make one piece from beginning to end. So right now you're seeing the card, uh, so let me, let me have people understand that there's I have the best of both worlds. I have the the world of creating this piece by throwing the vessel on the wheel. But I also have the benefit of being able to sculpt. And if you have both of those worlds where you can put them together, then you have the best of both worlds. So dealing with the piece, I actually have the vessel that is created. That's one part. Then from there, the beads are created. From there, the sculptured head is created, and then all of that actually has to be put together. So the first part is the carving onto that piece. That neck that you're not seeing with the beads around, that's the second part. The third part are those beads, and those beads by themselves takes about 12 to 15 hours to make because they're all being individually done, and not only that, they're getting texture to each one. From there, I go and do the head, and that's just the first fire. We're not talking about color, that's the, the fire where it's just all brown. From that point, it comes out of a, what they call a kiln, where it goes up to 1800 degrees. It's getting ready to go up to 2200 degrees. Then it gives it that chocolate color that we're seeing. And the, the, uh, the ebony color that we're seeing is very symbolic to me because I am from Virginia, I am from the capital of the South, and I wanted to use clay that was coming from the South, but also clay that was coming from the North. The black clay or the ebony clay that you're seeing, that is Northern clay that's coming from Pennsylvania, but the Southern clay that I do, which is brown, is coming from North Carolina. But dealing with the beads, uh, once they finished, I actually go through each individual one and I color every one with a prime color. From there, then they get their second color. And from that second color, then they may get a third and fourth color to actually give it the dimension that you're looking at.
then they all get strung onto their each individual rows. So that's probably 30 rows, if not more, of beads that you're seeing that's going all the way up to the top. And then from there, I uh, connect the head. Um, and sometimes I leave them off, I mean, where they can come apart, and then sometimes I put them together where they're epoxied, where they don't come apart. It's technically um, personal preference of the client, if, what they're looking for, because some people use these as um, keep sinks where they store secret items or memories inside of them. And then other people want them together because they like it as just a sculptural piece of art. And, the, and that's the nice part about being a functional potter, but also being a sculptor. I can allow these things to be sculpture, but I can also allow them to be a functional item that people can use if they chose to. And I, I like the thought of having memory jars for memories or your past, but um, also uh, functional items where you can drink or um, drink or eat out of. Because a lot of people don't understand that dealing with clay, it's the oldest craft in the world. So when they do an archaeological vent, uh, dig, this clay tells stories of many nations. And a lot of I think a lot of people don't realize that when they're looking at Discovery or National Geographic. We've been eating out of ceramic and wood forever, and we've just left that behind for paper plates. But once you actually have that bowl or a mug or a sculptural piece, these are things that you connect with and you appreciate with it because the person who uh, is working with clay is a very intimate thing. So you're not just getting um, a, a, a great piece or something you enjoy. You're getting something that... Um, um, you're getting a piece of that person, you know, who is creating that clay. Because you're going to see in my work thumbprints. You know, you're going to see the ridges and lines of my thumbs in there. And I could sand them out if, uh, if need be. But I want you to see that this is a piece that someone put a lot of love into. And we want, you know, as artists, we want you to connect with the work. We want you to be moved by it. We want you to be able to tell us a story from that. It may not be the story that we thought it was, and maybe we can get inspiration from you. And that's the most important part, is us inspiring one another and connecting with one another. Okay. Some of the people who have inspired me, um, in the beginning, um, it was Nyawin Weaver. In the beginning, it was Nyawin Weaver um, who inspired me to know my capabilities of producing from there, I went to Larry Poncho Brown, who showed me the aspect of business and how to respect your craft as a business, but also respect it, respect your creations. Um, from there, it was Woodrow Nash, um, appreciated my work, and Charles Smith, who is the uh, the guru of my craft, where he could, I, I actually have not even met this man yet, but we correspond by way of telephone, emails, texts, Instagram, Facebook, and so that I will never get persuaded by his work. And so he reviews my work and he can tell me when I am thinking about things and putting depth into them. And he can also tell when I'm, I'm very lazy when I'm putting work together. And uh, Joy Scott has also been an amazing help um, to asking me to stretch myself and think outside of the box. And Khabibi uh, has also been an inspiration in Karen Buster. And so there are many, many people who are down that line. So you don't have to have one specific mentor. You, um, there are pieces and pieces that are, pieces and bits that they're giving you so that you can prepare yourself for the future. And I've received something from all of them. And uh, it has been an amazing journey. <laughs>